Good evening, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Uh, this evening didn't start out very good. Uh, I was downloading all the um, artwork and photos from my cell phone onto my thumb drive when all of a sudden in the middle of that, uh, the cell phone decided it was going to update. And it just like stopped everything. Hardly anything got downloaded. I do have um, everything on a thumb drive. It's going to be a little bit different than I thought because what I've done is I put everything you know, according to decades, like early Wadsworth, 1910 to 19, you know, whatever, 20. So we're just going to pop through there. But before I even get into that, I, uh, I had uh, open heart surgery about two weeks ago. So that, that didn't help any. I've been collecting automotive stuff for mm, about three years or so. Every time I find something, I throw it onto the computer. So I uh, kind of thought I had a pretty good thing. And then I went through every phone book and every city directory and everything else in the last couple of weeks trying to find. But when I tell you, what it's, and, and uh, I understand we have a lot of automotive people here tonight. That's good because I'm probably going, like Roger said, I won't lean on you as much as anything else because what I found when I started looking at all the dealerships and the gas stations and the motorcycle dealers and anybody else had anything to do with gasoline, uh, it's like a bowl of spaghetti. Uh, you know, you would start out, somebody would be selling um, Cleveland automobiles or Chandler automobiles or you know, Kaisers and Dodges and all of a sudden they're not selling them anymore. They've either gone out of business or they didn't want to sell it anymore, so somebody else took it over. So over the years, uh, you know, everything from Steiner and Rohr to Rohr and Barton to Jack Summer uh, to Mickey Miller to, you know, there's a lot of history. Some of it's not always so good, but um, I'm going to try and make some sense of it. But if uh, there's two names that always come up at the very beginning. H.C. Uh, Gross is one of them. Andy Abel is the other one. Now, what I've understood reading about uh, Mr. Gross is he always had a very, uh, well, he was really the first other than Andy Abel, who brought the other one, but he really is one of the first uh, pioneers of the automobile business. And um, when he first started hearing about cars, he got real excited about it. <coughs> he built a um, big garage behind the Strand Theater. It was all modern with steam heat and everything. And his first cars that he brought for sale had a unique starting system. It's called the Armstrong starters <laughs> and if anybody knows about early cars the armstrong starters uh weren't hooked up to a battery you just like and you just always hoped it wouldn't kick back on you because um i've read about in wadsworth a lot of injuries broken shoulders so forth and so on but anyways he uh he brought the uh chandler and later the cleveland car which of course you probably didn't hardly even get moving. Um, then they went extinct on them. And you find out that in the early days, I read one time, I think in Ohio, they had like 300 different people trying to build cars in Ohio in the you know early days. So you'll see a lot of you know uh, brands of cars that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, but. Um, like I say, <laughs> you you get a dealership started, and sometimes I don't think the dealerships handled more than just a couple of cars. Uh, they basically call them agents, and I think some of these people basically were uh, selling them out of their barn, you know. But H.C. Gross was, uh, you know, the pioneer, really. Uh, Abel, Andy Abel was really the person who brought the horseless carriage to Wadsworth. And probably most of you know the story, but if not, he went up to Cleveland and bought one, I think for $300, an Oldsmobile. 
the old Mary Oldsmobile one longer, no steering wheel, I had the handle there that you steered it on. And um, yeah, he brought it back to uh, Wadworth and immediately tore it apart, boat by boat, piece by piece. He wanted to know what made him run, so, you know, I guess, you know, you buy it, it's yours, you tear it apart if you want to, and that's what he did. And so he stayed, you know, in uh, helping people. Matter of fact, you know, he is kind of instrumental in getting the first service station going. And he was very frustrated because the early service stations would only give you one gallon of gas at a time. So if you wanted five gallons, you had to pump it up five times and, you know, so. So he uh, called the manufacturer of the pumps and said, I want one that can pump 10 gallons. They turned around and says, no, we're not going to do it. So he kind of worked on and created one of his own. Uh, then after about three years, he decided that the money was in Akron. So he moved his business to Akron, but he stayed in Wandsworth. He stayed living here for quite a few years after that. Um, more than automobiles, he loved bicycles, which a lot of people started in, you know, with cars and buggies and different things, I mean, with uh, bicycles. And he actually uh, rode a bicycle from here to, I think it's 1903, to Chicago to go see the World's Fair. And not only did he ride his bicycle, he broke the land speed record in the bicycle. He made it faster than anybody else did. And I can only imagine how rough that was because would you have cow paths and, you know, dirt trails and everything? So it couldn't have been. So he moved to Akron, and one interesting story about him, I think it was in the 1930s sometime, he had his Oldsmobile, the old one lunger out, driving it around through Akron. Everyone was standing around watching it, you know, bang, bang, pow, pow, and everything as it's going down the road. All of a sudden, some cowboy came along with a lasso and lassoed him in the car, you know? And it's like, everyone is like, yeah, and everything. He's like, what's going on? What's with this guy, you know, lassoing me and everything? Well, it turned out to be a very famous um, politician and entertainer that came along a little bit later. So um, that was, he, I think, passed away in 1948, if I remember right, and his wife a little bit later. But uh, so that was, that was our two pioneers. Uh, I'm using a strange computer here, so sometimes all computers are strange. There it is. Where'd it go? There you are. We're looking at um, the early pioneers, and there it is, uh, Andy Avo. And um, I, a lot of us might have seen this picture before, the one on the um, bottom there, that's uh, supposedly High Street. And um, a couple years ago, I spoke about the Benjamin Franklin Highway that came through Wadsworth. And at that time, in the 20s and earlier, that's what a lot of Wadsworth streets look like. So uh, the horses didn't seem to have too much trouble with it but the cars didn't like it. So they, um, the city decided it was time to start to pave College Street and Broad Street, and then later, well, pave with bricks, you know, and then later Main Street. So that was um, our friend Andy. And there's um, H.C. Gross and his garage that, of course, is over, you know, behind the, the movie theater. That was a picture of it. And you see the chimney from the, um, well, it was a high school at that time. And I guess that was his crew over there, the dog and two or three mechanics and, you know, whoever. But uh, that was, uh, I don't know if that's a Chandler or a Cleveland. But that was one of his early cars. And more about, there's a picture of Andy a little bit later in his life. Um, that's when they had his funeral. Let me see if I can bring that up a little bit taller. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 1948, but um, I wish I didn't have to use <coughs> There we go. And that's another picture of them. And uh, here's uh, another article. I, I, they wrote more articles about the Obels than anybody in the Beacon Journal. There's one of his cars earlier. And I guess. All right, so we're through with the early. Let's get on with. Um, I'm going to look at things from 1910 to 1920. Okay, one of the early cars, it's, it's sold by the Waters Motor Company, which was right here in downtown, was the EMF. And I didn't know what it stood for, but I can't tell you right now. So, uh, that was uh, one of the, they sold it in a touring car and roadsters and a demi tonus. So that was the three. And uh, they were promised that the same day you placed the order that you would get one. So, uh, so order it now. Then we had uh, the Wadsworth Motor Company, the same people that sold that, also sold Flanders motorcycles, which was um, kind of a, a thing here that uh, we had several different motorcycle dealers around town and it seemed like every other year they were moving to another location now I don't know whether the uh, the overhead was not that great but uh, here's another early company uh, that was in the buggy business and the reason I put that on there because in the early days, 1911, 1920, there was still a lot of horse and carriages around. I mean, you know, the cars were, you know, coming on in the 20s, but there's a lot of people that wasn't willing to give up their horse and buggy yet. And uh, Fraser Company was a place that uh, restored your buggy. They sold the uh, Sherman Williams paint, buggy paint. So if you need to paint your buggy, your lawn furniture, that was the place to go. Another person who was instrumental in uh, the early automobile business was O.V. Dibble. He was basically out of Medina, but he was a car dealership and he sold the um, different cars here in Ohio. Like I said, sometimes they were just, eight. Um, he would say all he had to do is give it oil and gasoline. And when you come home a little late, run in the barn, go in the house and eat your supper. No cleaning horses. And from one day to, you know, to two hours a day. So that was a good thing about the horseless carriage. You came home, you parked it in the barn, you went and ate supper. You didn't have to feed it or wash it or anything else. Now, the Studebaker. Now, I'm kind of fond of Studebakers. I always have been. I used to belong to the Studebaker car club and everything. We had quite a few people around that sold Studebakers. Um, at first, um, the Wadsworth Motor Company, they had the Studebaker franchise for quite a long time. And that was like um, 1912, they, they were selling Studebakers. You could also buy one in Ritman. Now you can go to um, a dealership in Sharon Center which was actually on Cleveland Road, they said Sharon Center, and you can get a Studebaker there. Studebakers were quite popular at that time because they'd been around for a while to begin with. They're making wagons and carriages and so forth and so on. So they had kind of a trusted name. If you wanted to call them, you just one one two one and let it ring twice, and they would pick it up and. Uh, Wurtz Buggy was still around when they were selling cars, you know, because they, uh, again, uh, a lot of people kind of felt like, well, you've seen what the roads are like, let's put it that way. So if you had a horseless carriage in the car, 
once you get out of city limits, like um, like I explained when we talked about the Benjamin Franklin High, once you got out of the Wazza city limits, start going up Acme Hill, there was no more pavement. So um, the old cars, uh, the old horse and buggy was still practical for a lot of people. So then there was S.H. Hawkinsmith. The Hawkinsmiths were big in the um, uh, stone, you know, uh, business. They did tombstones and sandstones for sharpening knives. And they had a place up there in High Street. But um, S.H. was, I guess, part of that family because when I tried to research that name, it kept taking me to the people that did, you know, uh, slabs of rock and everything. So um, I didn't really find out too much, but he was the first Ford dealer in Wadsworth. Where are you going? <laughs> yeah, see, this is continuing right here. So let's get out of there. It's going on here. Okay. Where are we at? Still, another person in the buggy business was M.P. Rice, and uh, he um, specialized in the Gershenslager uh, buggies. And he was still doing that in 1912. Yep. Let's go back one more here. And there was Ira Razor. I don't know if anybody knows who Ira. There were so many Razors in Wadsworth. Uh, he was uh, one of the first agents for the Hupmobile here in Wadsworth. And uh, he was selling those um, in 1913. And I've never been able to um, do any. Does anybody know Ira? Let me know who he was. No? Okay, I don't either. But he, okay, then there was Hearts on Duck Company, and they uh, were uh, big into motorcycles. And they uh, were selling Harley Davidsons, and uh, they were selling those on Dutt Street, which is, I don't think Dutt Street exist anymore but it was down in the south end um, and that was in 1913 he also um, you know was into uh, Prestolite and um, different parts made by them and uh, C.A. Moore uh, was selling Indian bikes in 1913 and it said behind the rear of the electric package office. So it, if you was expecting an electric package, you'd find the Indian motorcycles. So uh, again, a lot of these things are so far in our history that they're just really hard to you know even pinpoint where they were at. And he sold uh, Indian motorcycles, bicycles, red rubber bicycle tires, and did bicycle repairing. <coughs> And there is the F.G. Alderfer and Company Studebaker dealer out of Sharon Center, Ohio. And they sold Studebakers on through the 1930 area. You can buy a Studebaker 6 for $1,550, which in 1913 was you know, a pretty good chunk of money. Or you could take the cheap model $885, you know. And... Um, in 1915, I was talking about H.C. Gross again. Uh, he gave an exhibition of the Chandler car in the square Monday, which caused much comment. With the car running at two miles per hour in high gear, he set the steering wheel and stepped onto the pavement, permitting the machine to circle him a dozen times. Not content with that, Gross headed uh, the machine straight. Then he stood in the rear seat where it ran from one of the square to the other. I guess that uh, was pretty exciting for those days, you know, but uh, I'm sure a lot of people were probably cussing them out, saying, you know, what are you trying to do? 
All right, we'll just move right past that one. Cause, and then there was a nice wonder garage that sold the Buick car. And they sold that right off the town square. And then there was Wadsworth Motor Company, which was, you know, a very popular uh, uh, dealer in Ohio, one of the earliest. And they sold the Flanders, another name that has been lost in history, you know. And um, they had a magneto and five lamps, a tube horn, and a generator. So um, if you want a uh, demonstration, you just called ring twice on 1121. Uh, people throwing too much trash around. And then um, out on South Main Street, uh, if you didn't particularly want to buy a car, but wanted to save time, there is DK Stover. Um, he sold tractors now. I, I looked it up uh, for 39 South Main Street, and there's just a house there right now, you know, a fairly newer house. And so I guess uh, the tractor dealer went away and they built a house there. So he uh, sold um, all sorts of the newer type tractors that were coming out at that time. Okay, and now. Yeah. I don't know what year it was. Wadsworth well, now has three garages and auto repair shop. The last one to open was the Stevenson Carriage Shop on High Street. See, there's a transition there. He decided he didn't want to build the carriages anymore. So um, Mr. R. Stevenson and Normal Stein had accepted the agency for the Ford machine. Now, <laughs> as I said earlier, you're going to see these car dealers bouncing their different makes, I think, there was like four or five different people that actually sold the, the Ford, and it's kind of interesting now. A.G. Durling on Broad Street um, sold um, R. Davidson bicycles. He also sold campers. Now, you wouldn't think back in those days that people had too much you know, going, but they actually had campers. They hooked on to the back of their car, so Campers, nothing new. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to move into another decade. And we're going into... Series, that must be the 20s, it's not saying that. Well, that's in the 50s there, so no, it wasn't, it's, it's not putting the years all the way across it. Here we go, in the 30s. All right. So things started progressing a little bit more by the 30s, and uh, we started seeing more oil dealers and, and, uh, <laughs> and computers that freeze up. There we go. There's uh, the Nicodemus uh, Oil Company that opened up in the 20s, and they were really one of the more early full-service gas stations in Wadsworth. Uh, they sold Fleet Wing Golden Master Gasoline. And then Wright's Automotive Service came into existence where the Chandler, the uh, gross uh, guy, had his, and uh, he sold the Nash. Now, you see the Nash there, but you're going to see it other places too. They, they went from here to there, and he uh, eventually, you know, went to Buick. But at first, he started selling the Nash. That was his first thing. And then there was Steiner Rohr, uh, who was the uh, predecessor of Warren Barton. Now, uh, Steiner, when he um, sold out his partnerships, and he took um, quite a bit of that money and donated it to build the rec center here in town. So uh, Mr. Steiner was very community oriented, um, did a lot for Wadsworth, but I guess um, 
the car business wasn't, even though he stayed in there for a long time. Uh, you might have seen pictures, um, and I don't know if we're going to come across the one that was on my phone that died, it was um, the uh, Gypsy Tour. And it was like 75 motorcycles that uh, started here, and they put on a very long time. And wherever they went to, they had a great time. They went swimming and boating and all sorts of stuff. And fortunately, it says no mishaps were in that um, adventure. And that was in 1931. There's pictures, hopefully we'll come across it. One, they were all uh, parked in front of the Grace Lutheran Church over there, and there's like 75. The other picture I've seen is over there by um, the old Wadwood Bakery, you know, on, by East Park there, so. Um, these are going to be too small. Oh, that's just talking about the uh, Nicodemus was going to open in uh, 1936. That's an article about that, but. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, tell us about the Nicodemus Oil Company. I know the story about and my grand my grandfather bought it, and he he had four sons that worked worked in it at different times, and uh, he finally. I just sold the business to my my father's mother's my my father's in laws. Okay. Uh, no, no. So to Baldwin, 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 Baldwin. The Baldwin's, okay. And uh, they had it for years and years. Mm -hmm. They're at the corner of South yeah. Party and yeah, South Party and College, right? They sold their credit cards and mm -hmm. they did lots. I did a lot of hand work and I, I was supposed to have, again on the phone that crashed had a picture of Nicodemus uh, Oil. The, it was a pretty big station, you know, for its time. Okay, there is Mr. Steiner. And uh, he's kind of got a big head there. And at that time, he was selling safety-tested used cars. Now, he didn't sell all these cars new. They were used. He had Plymouth, DeSoto, Oldsmobile, Willys, Ford, Chevrolet, Graham, Lafayette. Uh, he said the prices are right, the cars are right, or double your money back. So, you know, he, uh, he had the most complete line of safety-tested cars in Wadsworth. So... Um, and then for a while there was Mill, uh, Mills Motors. Uh, again, I really haven't found him. I've been even asking around and said, uh, coming soon, uh, Willie's uh, Mills Motors. And they were also on Broad Street behind where Wright is. So whether he was uh, bought into their dealership or what, I don't know. And then I've only seen the advertisements for like a year. And uh, and then we're getting into the gas stations. In the corner of North Lyman and Broad Street, there was a golf station there. And of course, that had been right over here. And that was a golf station at that time. Wayne Koppelberger owned it. And that was in 1937. And... Then there was the Benjamin Franklin. I don't, did anybody ever hear when I talked about the Benjamin Franklin Highway coming through Wadsworth? Anyways, um, it was a really big deal. It was a transcontinental highway, and unfortunately, Wadsworth really never paid much homage to it. Um, it went from New Jersey all the way to San Francisco, and uh, 224, or 97 at that time, actually, was... Uh, Part of it went to Indiana, Illinois, and everything. Well, a lot of the places around town started 
picking up that name, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, it was formerly the Wright Automotive Service. It was at 426 College Street, which is, you know, out there a little ways. And for his grand opening, he gave away free motor oil. And Okay, now I wish I had the full story on this one. And somewhere in the 30s, they had a flap with the car sales in Wadsworth, and I would read about it a little bit. Um, they somehow put a mortgage on some of the cars that they sold uh, without the people's knowing about it. And it seemed like um, it was kind of almost something legitimate <clears throat> until people, you know, found out that uh, there was something fishy going on and they had a, uh, uh, some lawyers, some Cleveland attorneys come down and look into it. And this went on for a while. Finally, uh, it turned out that the, the consumer won over on that deal. And uh, it uh, was uh, the National Acceptance Company of Youngstown uh, was the one that uh, had placed these mortgage on. So if you got a loan through them. Okay, in 1931, it was Ford Day. And the Keller Motor Company. So we're back to that corner again um, on College Street. A lot went on that corner. <laughs> and the Ford dealer had that for a while, quite a long time in that corner, and then the Star Theater wanted that. So the Ford Garage had to find another place to go. So they went out on off College Street to Tolbert and stayed out there for a while until they could find a different place to set up their Ford dealer. And I don't know, there must have been some kind of wrangling or something about that corner. But of course, after it was Star, then it was Keller, then it was Firestone, you know, everyone wanted to be on that corner. There's H.J. Uh, Hall, and uh, it's not, at that time, not necessarily a car dealer, but it's transportation. And uh, it was 1939, I think it was, that, you know, that burned down. They rebuilt it over here in the corner of, uh, again, uh, South Lyman and there. But he was in the uh, business later in the 50s. You can go there and buy an international truck from him. So I think it was our only international dealer in town. And there's again the uh, Nicodemus. And, and here's a, a really interesting thing. There was no motors on these, but in 1930, um, the soapbox derby started. And it said there that, I guess I'm going to stand for the microphone. It said there that it was actually the biggest sporting event ever held in Wadsworth when they uh, had the first soapbox derby. And um, Mr. Hayes from the Chevrolet dealers, one of the sponsors, Chevy was always a sponsor of that, but uh, also um, there's a couple other uh, people, uh, Mr. Arnold, and um, so forth and so on. So it was Donald uh, Z B I N D E N Zip. I don't know. How you... So, anyways, uh, the uh, Andy Cooper was a publisher of the Wadsworth newspaper, and Dave Stratton was a official. I don't know what hill they went down. Probably not South Main Street. Had been. Pretty speedy. And we're back to the Nash again. And this time there's quite a few people sound Nash, but um, Wright Automotive was still uh, sound. That was just an advertisement for them and how if you had x-ray eyes, you could see how they were built. Mm -hmm. And the Oakland was also uh, Fiscus Motor Sales. And he was on Owl Street, you know, and uh, there was, it, it kind of interesting, the, the garage is still there, you know, I, I, I wasn't there down Oval Street for many, many years, and I was on Google Maps, you know, looking where all these places were, so I could identify them, 
And um, he lived at 134 Oval Street, but the garage was, I guess, uh, a different address. But you look it up on uh, Google Maps and it shows the house. But there's two uh, buildings next to each other. So I don't know if they were both Fiscus or somebody else had one of the two buildings but the one right there, it's still a three garage door. And there is the, uh, Goodyear, the Goodrich Rubber Company who had uh, sent all these cars out all across the country to test their tires and so people can come and inspect them. And they uh, stopped and uh, dressed up their tires and uh, all their drivers were, you know, their tech talk about all the technical things and um, they had traveled all across the country through mud and snow and blazing deserts and torrentious mountain hills to come. All right, another decade. Okay, so where's the 40s? 40s is a wartime, of course, we know, and um, so there wasn't a lot going on in the way of sales of automobiles. But they did find out that uh, salt wasn't going to rust at your cars. That's what the Detroit people said. So don't worry about it. That salt isn't going to rust at your car. Even though it was falling apart in your driveway, uh, you just had to wash your car every once in a while. Well, any of us have looked at the cars from the 40s and 50s, they did rust out. So, Hayes Arnold was doing a complete paint job for your Chevrolet for $75. And it come out sparkly bright, as you can see. And they'd put uh, lubrication and they put seat covers and sell you a used car that you think is going to be a really nice one. There's the, uh, the Pure Station, which was uh, Steinert and Rohr at that time. Uh, when I knew Warren Barton, the Pure Station was not there anymore. It was just the, the Plymouth DeSoto dealer. But before, this is in the 40s, you can tell by the car, uh, they did sell Pure Gas and they had the pumps out there pictures of a 41 Oldsmobile. 41? Okay, well then, I had it in the 30s, so. Uh, the drive-in theater. After the war was over, it took a couple of years, but uh, everything started being centered around the automobile. You know, drive in this, drive up that, a bank, ice cream, restaurants, so forth and so on. And in 1947, the blue sky opened up. So you can go now and see a movie without getting out of your car. So uh, Dale Morrison of Wadworth and John Selby of Cleveland was um, the first owners. And that opened up in, um, yeah, it was uh, 47, but the last, it opened up last week. I think, it, yeah, it was in July of 1947. So in case you're ever wondering how old the blue sky is, and there's more articles about uh, Andy Abel, which I, uh, the Beacon Journal made a, a killing talking about Andy Abel, so. Uh, what is, or is it 50s, 70s? Um, it, be this one. Some of these. Yeah, okay. Now we moved into the 50s. Something more of us will remember. And uh, Wadsworth Motors was still downtown. In 53, they hadn't moved up to the end of Broad Street, yeah, where later they become McD Ford. But at that time, um, it was the big new 53 Ford. So, um, 
and it was on a corner broad and I went in louder milk. Now, I have ads, I don't have it, it was on my cell phone that went kaput on the way over here. Uh, louder milk, uh, motor sales, which, you know, we talked about the other Studebaker dealers earlier, uh, but I have um, ads that go way back to the 40s. I don't know exactly, you know, when he opened the dealership, but he had been there for a long time. And I asked, one of the relatives asked the week, and she thought it was in the 50s that he opened up, but I found ads uh, a little bit. Oh, there's the free oil again. Okay, the thrill of the year is the Buick. And you could have that big monster for $2,278 over at Wright Buick. And uh, it was bigger than the kids. That was 1955. Yeah, 55. And that was probably a pretty good price back in 55, you know, 2200 But you're buying a Buick, so. And uh, there is one a little bit later. And it's a four-door beauty from Wright Buick. So there was quite a few other, of course, what they did is they all threw in their money, I guess, and ran an ad, so. But Wright Buick was right down there in the Those middle. four holes on the left front center? Yeah. Say that it's a Roadmaster. Yeah, okay. No, not necessarily. And there's the Nash again. And there's the Oakland. I don't know what they're doing there. We're way past them. All right. And 30s, 40s, 60s. Okay, now we're getting into the modern days. And I'm probably going to rely on some of you to explain. Now, there's the Wadsworth Oil Company, and they were on College Street, and uh, they sold not only uh, gas, but they also had heating oil, and they had some very large tanks out on the south end of town. It's a place where they stored thousands of gallons of fuel oil, according to this. And uh, also, somebody else that uh, was on the scene as far as, you know, and again, that was on the other side, is uh, the Carino Ignition Company, who was Caesar's brother. I, Paul was his name. And unfortunately, he left us too early in life. But he was... Uh, uh, it tied in with the carburetor in ignition, you know, before he went out on Silver Creek. And I know my dad knew him quite well. And uh, there is McD Ford now. So we've so left. Building and this is where Carino was. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was. Uh, well, I got, I, I, I'm tied into that a little bit, but I won't explain it now. <laughs> But I knew the Carinos. Uh, and then there you are. Uh, the new cars started coming out in 1960. I think the Lark came out a uh, year before the rest of them did. But that year you had the Falcon, the Corvair, the Valiant. Uh, they all, you know, had their subpack, or their compact car. It wasn't really a subcompact. So everyone was running out to see all these cars and what happened there was the 61 valiant over at roar and barton and uh, for some of this is just kind of a sideline here uh when they first come out they had a lumen block um, slant six engine that wasn't really available but you can actually have that car with all these things put on at the dealer as accessories. But NASCAR for a while was running like uh, junior NASCAR or whatever. Uh, and it was all the smaller cars like the Corvairs and the Valiants. And um, they stopped it because nobody could beat the, those slant sixes with lumen block. They thought it was unfair. So that didn't last long. They were I don't even know that because I was the uh, secretary of the Magic Cruisers in Barberton I was doing. So that was Rambler's uh, uh, addition to the subcompact and that was out at Larson's and they were out there in Broad Street with the rest of them. And uh, you know, either you look. What I liked about Larson, 
this is kind of a, <laughs> uh, Rambert is they also sold uh, the Metropolitans out there. And we used to ride our bicycles out there when we were 15 or so, clear up the Broad Street because we could sit in the Metropolitans and turn the radio on. You didn't need a key. So we'd go up there and sit and listen to WHLO or whatever, you know, on our radios and pretend like we were driving. We weren't old enough to drive yet. And there is uh, Louder Milk's edition. Now, this is kind of what I uh, was trying to get into is in 1961. In 1960, I think they built the first national bank. It was right in that area. And in 61, all the car dealerships in town decided they're going to have a car show. And it was actually kind of late. It was already into October, the end of October, something like that. But every car dealership in town, especially it seems like they're really showing off their new Larks, their Falcons, and their Corvairs and stuff. But they were showing off everything. And that was Wadsworth first, and as far as I know, the only car show. But you can go there, and the salesman from First National Bank were walking around and ready to sign you up for a loan and take you. I think it was more uh, for the First National Bank to sell your cars than it was for the, but they were right there on the spot, ready to <laughs> sign you up and sell your car. Uh, this is, oh, a water driver is fined $10 for speeding on July 20th, this was in 1930. It was in the paper in the 60s, you know, 30 years ago, uh, in the down along memory lane. And uh, while the state law set the speed limit from eight to 15 miles per hour in the village, it was an uncommon sight to see people speeding with their machines along at 25 mile an hour. And uh, someone got fined $10 for that. Kenny Razor. A lot of people knew Kenny Razor. Uh, he worked for Wright. I guess he also worked for H.J. Hall. But anybody that went to high school in the 60s, especially the guys and stuff like that, he was the teacher for um, the uh, automotive class. And until they moved it a couple of years later, it was in the old uh, Wright Buick dealer because Wright Buick closed up in 1965. Uh, they decided to he didn't want to be in the business anymore. So the building was there, and that's where, and the first year they had 75 boys sign up for that, and he had been working at H.J. Hall for 22 years, so uh, him and uh, Willard Houston were both, you know, H.J. Hall, and they went over and decided to teach the young men how to operate or rebuild a car. All right. And uh, Hardeman Rudy's. They used to be a big sign there. It's kind of hard to see. <coughs> but I got that out of the uh, newspaper and had to clean it up a little bit. I can remember the um, Chevy had OK used cars. Ford had something. Um, Rambler had value fair. Fair value cars. And there's a grand opening for uh, Carino Ignition. And that was in October of 1960. And uh, that was, uh, he had a lot of uh, people. OK. This uh, jumps back again. Like I say, we just kind of put these together. Uh, that was uh, Derling's uh, showroom in one of his locations in Wadsworth. Like I say, they, they moved from place to place. And there's a picture of Jack Summer's dealership after it was Hayes Arnold. And Jack Summer bought it and uh, quickly moved it up to Broad Street. So you're kind of standing on the Chevy dealer right now. In case you didn't know, you might have 100 Chevy through here. And um, in 1961, uh, Ford came out with uh, the new Fairlane 500, and uh, Rutan, W.S. Rutan, President of Rutan Motors, decided uh, to give away a Fairlane 500. And uh, 
it happened all around the country and uh, Mrs. Catherine Larson of uh, 220 Lyman Street was the winner of the new Ford. I don't know if it's still around or not. Um, this was from Gartner's uh, Ohio. He had to, all the cheerleaders come out and pump gas one day and that made quite a uh, fun time for the gentleman. I imagine he sold a lot of gas. <coughs> what time is it? Anyways, uh, 8.30, oh, we got a little time. And uh, the comfy strutters were doubling as jockey ets that day. So there's a picture of Jack Summer before he remodeled. Um, he had another grand opening in 1964 or five, six, something. Anyways, uh, he remodeled. And I, I said one thing about Jack Summer, you know, to begin with, he died way too early. And, um, but he promoted cars more than anybody else in this town. He had more giveaways, more stuff. And then when he had the uh, grand opening in the, the mid 60s, he had teen dances out there in the parking lot and all sorts of giveaways, free uh, clinics to bring your car in so you can take, you, you know, take a look at your car and see if, you know, if there's anything that needed. I, I don't know of any other car dealer in town that I could remember of that ever promoted himself as much as Jack Summer did. And there was, um, yeah, right on the corner of College and Stratford was the uh, <coughs> golf, and by that time, Kreider, it was uh, Kreider that took over. And I love them Studebakers. Um, yeah, he gave me this picture, or somebody did, somebody that knew him really well, I don't know what it was, but I restored it best I could, and um, it was uh, just, a beautiful red car that I wish was in my driveway, but I don't have a driveway. There's more of the, uh, the auto show. And this time, the Mercury dealer now, there's another story behind that one too. It was uh, Thielen Black that originally had the Mercury dealership, and that was done there where the, well, we still call it the quarter car wash. It's long since, you know, I've grown a quarter. But um, then it was Good Motors. Somewhere along the line, and I've been trying to pinpoint the exact date, um, something happened and it set fire to the dealership. It was a Quonset hut. Um, it was a plastics company. It was Good had already been out of business. Okay. It was a plastic company in there that burnt down. Oh, it wasn't him anymore. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. But anyways, he uh, was still, but when Good was finished with it, then it was Frenchy Claude, and they went out to Broad Street, and uh, later they just called it Claude Mercury. I guess the Frenchy didn't you know, go over really big, but it was out there on the other side of uh, Hardeman Rudy's. And there's the Rutan Ford they went to, it was McD Ford, then Rutan Ford, then Wadsworth Ford. I'm not sure whether there's any buyers in between. I bought a new pickup from them when it was Wadsworth Ford. Um, they said they advertised. And there's Jack Summers with their used car department. And there's some more of the mighty fanfare of the Wadsworth Auto dealers. And then there's uh, an ad for Mickey Rutan, the Ford man. Okay, this uh, was from 1960, and there were still curbside <coughs> gas pumps over at Merriman's, and the city said, mm, got to get rid of those. So they banned anybody that had uh, curbside gas pumps. That was a uh, thing of the past. Now. There was three different owners of 
Jack Summer after first his sales manager, you know, took over and then Serpentini, I think was the last owner, but uh, he was uh, out of Orville and he had car dealerships all over the place. But coming back down the street was uh, the old Pontiac dealer and that was Mickey Miller. And I guess I wasn't in Wadsworth at that time. I was out there and uh, I guess he was laundering money, you know, and got himself in a little bit of trouble. So, but he was, seemed to all said now, the funny thing is, all of a sudden they started selling Vauxhalls. I never remember that, but the ads were that, you know, he was also selling Vauxhalls and Citrons. Maybe somebody remembers Citrons over there. Jim Rich. Jim Rich. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. It was still Jim Rich, but uh, it was later Mickey Miller. So Maserati's. Yeah, there's a Maserati thing I saw too, but. Um, but before we run out of time, uh, does anybody have anything to share about their uh, familiarity with any of the service stations here in town? I want to give, you know, at least a few minutes. Uh, we are heard from the Nicodemus, but go ahead. Uh, it was that happened at around this time, right before Halloween, and I had a little, what was my cart? A little cart sitting out in the driveway, mm -hmm. and somebody sprayed me. And so I took it to Mickey uh, Miller's Pontiac. That was right across from Sacred Heart, right? And they buffed it out, and so I asked how much it was going to cost, and they said, nothing, just you know, go on your way. It was easy enough to do. So that was my experience with the dealership there. Nice people. Uh, in wrote some of these down that I did have pictures for on my cell phone before it crashed. Uh, but these are some of the, uh, not only the dealers, but some of the service stations in Wadsworth in probably like the late 20s. There's Wall Service on High and 261. There was um, Facto Gas. I don't know where they were at, but they were in the phone book. Uh, Morn Mornwick Motor Sales, and they were on South Pardee. And the one thing I forgot to mention in the car dealerships, I said they, how they were moving all over town. On Tobert Street, they had the Kaiser dealer out there for a while, and he sold the Kaisers and the Henry J's. And Seifert, back in town, had the Nash, and all of a sudden, and what happened at that time in the 50s, a lot of these uh, car dealers were going under and being bought out. You know, the uh, Seifert sold the Nash and he also sold the Packard. The Packard and the Nash were being bought out by American Motors and uh, Ram uh, Rambler, uh, Studebaker. You know, it's kind of hard to say, you know, when people says we bought them out and the other person says, but anyways, there's all these merging. So when these car dealers merged, you kind of lost probably, you know, your dealership and uh, the Studebaker down on College Street there, when they went out in 65, he advertised, we're still here. We're going to fix your Studebakers. Don't worry about it because there was a lot of Studebakers. So even though they weren't making them anymore, he said he's going to stay around. But there was Russell Harp Tire. Um, there was R.G. Hood with his motorcycles in H.J. Hall, like I said. Uh, he later sold international trucks, um, Keller Motors, and the Seifert, like I said, you know. Uh, I have a few incidental stories here, but one that I want to share, uh, the, if I could find the, the right picture here. Nope, there I went. Yeah. Sam, use somebody else's computer. I know it's on there. Uh, 
Okay, we are going to go to some wildlife here. Now you're going to say, what in the world should you get Woody Woodpecker on there for? Uh, if I had time, there's a lot of things that went on. Oh, if you can see it, there's a gypsy tour of motorcycle people. That was supposed to be on there, but... Uh, okay, that was... The first automobile thievery was in 1915 when someone stole a Buick. Uh, they only got as far as Western Star because the roads were all muddy. Um, also in the 20s and early 20s, uh, car craziness was in the full swing and this was the Flying Mercury and that was a weekly story in the news banner. So I guess that was... <laughs> We're finally here. <sighs> this is my. This one story I have here was uh, when they first, uh, 1916, when the cars first started coming out, they're having a terrible time down in the square because everybody was crisscrossing the square and cutting across zigzag and everything else so they had to make some new laws about how to drive in downtown now oh, here we go that's page one here we go i'm going to sit down i'm going to try and speak loud uh this happened in 1917 a party of people had a very narrow escape from death last Thursday when their auto upset as a result of a most peculiar accident. The party composed of um, Norman Weldy, son of Mr. and Mrs. Grant Weldy, on Porty Street, and Mrs. L.A. Neely and daughters Mrs. Miss Ruth, um, Naomi, Esther, and Mary um, on Durling Drive left Monday last week for Mingo, where on Tuesday they attended a birthday celebration for Mrs. Neely's mother. The watches party remained until Thursday morning when the return trip was started at 9 o'clock. They had been on their way less than a half an hour when they had traveled but four and a half minutes, four and a half miles, they were near the North Lawrenceburg driving along at a lively rate of on a newly graveled road when a red-headed woodpecker flying across the road flew over the open windshield and came so near to the driver's face that uh, he put up his hand for protection. He was wearing glasses and goggles and no one uh, and one lens of the ladder was broken, although it occurred so quickly that Mrs. Weldy does not know whether or not the bird struck him. It was just at this point the machine struck an object in the road and it was turned to one side. It crashed into a gate which was reduced to kindling wood, next striking a large post which uh, swerved and the auto around and turned it over inside. All the occupants were thrown out and all except for Naomi were injured. Mrs. Weldy stopped the engine, which continued to run after the machine. Mrs. Neely's glasses were broken and she received bad cuts about the right eye and bruises. Miss Ruth's right knee was injured. Mary sustained um, a looking for money only. I don't know what that sends in. They had bruises on the face, her right I was swollen shut, Esther was scratched above the face, and Mr. Weldy's right arm was scratched, and his entire body was very sore. For several days, the dead bird was found in the back of the machine. <laughs> they called cars machines back then. Everything was the top headlights and windshield and one fender of the auto were smashed. The radiator damaged and the front spring and various braces about the machine were ruined. The accident occurred near a farmhouse where assistance was uh, secured and sent to Lewisburg for help. A touring car conveyed the party to the home of Mrs. Neely's brother, and um, they all remained until Saturday when 
her brother came home. So, nowadays you worry about hitting a deer in a road and all the damage. They hit a woodpecker or a woodpecker hit them and <laughs> told the car and scratched them up and beat them up and everything. Well, I know there's probably a lot more about the history of Wadworth car dealerships and like I said, it's like reaching into a spaghetti bowl. You just keep pulling. You don't know what's going to come out of that bowl. So I appreciate you all listening tonight. I'm sorry that the uh, phone crashed on me because uh, I had pictures of a lot of the gas stations and everything, but you know what happens. <laughs> Thank you very much.